Hello, I'm Caleb Howard, and this is Redemption Arc. This podcast takes stories from the Bible, Christian history, and Christian literature, and uses them to challenge the popular conception of God. For too long, people of all sorts have used the Bible to hold up outdated, isolating worldviews, changing the definitions of love and forgiveness in order to use religion as a weapon against people. This podcast will reframe the biblical narrative into a beacon of inclusivity and hope. God has thrown himself in between us and death. He has not only shown mercy on people who have time and time again made terrible decisions, but he has helped those people change and grow. No matter how badly we screw up, we are still loved and we still belong. Every single person who relies on God can claim their redemption arc. In this podcast, I'll be using the Hebrew name Yahweh for the biblical God quite often. Though the Bible only gives a consonance for God's real name, YHWH, many scholars believe that God's proper name is Yahweh. While some people make a big deal out of this, I'm only using the name Yahweh for clarity to emphasize both God's distinct personhood and to distinguish him from the other deities of the ancient world. This is my very first episode, and I'm going to start off with a brief trigger warning. There's multiple instances of attempted sexual assault, and there is a successful sexual assault toward the end. It won't be graphic. I have a general policy against any depiction of sexual assault, but that wasn't an option today. Our first story will be from the Bible book of Genesis. Genesis, a word that means beginnings, is the title of the first book of the Bible. Many believe that the central theme of Genesis is the creation of the world. But if that were true, the book would stop at chapter 2. Instead, the theme of Genesis is that, though humanity has gone far off the rails and messes up in embarrassing ways, God has begun a plan to restore us to our original state of happiness, godliness, and human dignity. Of the stories of people going off the rails, none is more egregious than the story of Lot. Have you ever watched a series of unfortunate events? There's a song at the beginning warning you to stay away, because there's not going to be a happy ending. It's a catchy song, and I'll drop a YouTube link in the description, but I'm not going to sing. The story of Lot is the same way. There's no happy ending to this story, but there are a whole lot of lessons. So if you like hearing stories about self-inflicted misery and suffering, tonight's your night. Tune in, and we'll start the story of Lot with a servant who can't stop making puns. A tall, muscular man came running wildly up the hill, clothes torn, turban unraveled and flapping in the wind behind him, and blood trickling from his smashed nose down the remnants of his robes. He fell at his master's feet. They were all in a lot of trouble. The master looked down at his servant. Foreign invaders? Assassins? The servant shook his head. Not that dire, just a lot of entitled shepherds. See, Abram's shepherds seemed to think that just because their master had been given orders by God to come to this land, they were allowed to take what they wanted. Abram's sheep needed a lot of food and a lot of water, and when Abram's shepherds couldn't find enough, they tried to take it from the master's shepherds. The servant had fought hard but his master needed to go down there pronto. There was a lot to work out. The master, whose name was Lot, rolled his eyes back as far as they could go. The servant had said Lot way too many times for it to be an accident, and he didn't take kindly to people using his name as a pun. The servant didn't see the problem. There were going to be a lot of those in this podcast episode, so Lot could back all the way off of him on this one. 
Lot threw a cloak around himself and stumbled off in the general direction of where the sheep grazed. Abram thought he was really special, but this went way too far. Assaulting his servants? He spat. Abram wouldn't hear the end of this. When Lot got down to the sheep, Abram was pacing back and forth in anxiety. Lot's words of rage choked back in his throat as Abram bowed to Lot. He was really sorry for that whole spat between the servants. Lot hadn't been expecting this and as such didn't know what to say, so he stayed silent. Abram continued. This ought to be a lesson for both of them. In the past, they'd been able to share the same plot of land relatively well. But Lot had gotten far richer and Abram was absolutely here for it, but it seemed that now it was inevitable that there were going to be quarrels over the increasingly scarce resources. It was probably better for them to split up and each make their own way in the world. Did they really want to be slugging it out over the water for a few sheep? Abram had a solution. Lot could choose where he wanted to go, and Abram would go in the opposite direction. Problem solved. The two walked, mostly in silence, to the top of a steep hill that offered a view of the surrounding countryside. Abram held his arm out. Where did Lot want to go? Lot looked at the crags toward the west, the rough stony ground toward the north, and the dry stretches of barren land toward the south. Then he happened to look out toward the east, and what he saw made his jaw drop. He saw flat plains, brilliant green, interspersed with splotches of golden flowers. Rows of crops combed the edges of the river, and puffy gray clouds blanketed the green fields, showering them with a soft, nourishing rain. Lot held out his right arm greedily, as if to grasp that beautiful land and make it his forever. He looked toward Abram. He wanted that land. As the sun sank in the western horizon, Lot sat cross-legged in his tent, his servants laughing and joking around a crackling fire. Their faces grew sober as Lot told them about the conversation with Abram. They were hoping that Abram hadn't found out, or at least hadn't informed Lot, that Lot's servants had been the ones who started the trouble. But their faces began to break into smiles as they found out about the deal Lot had secured. The more Lot said, the better they felt until they began to howl with laughter. Abram didn't even try to get a piece of the Jordan floodplain. He wasn't nearly as smart as he made himself out to be. So much for his assertions of God's guidance or whatever that was. Lot nodded. Tonight, they would feast. Tomorrow, they would be packing their bags and going to fertile fields where they could graze their sheep in comfort. Years passed. Living among Abram's tents was just a distant memory for Lot. In fact, the memory of being a nomadic traveler, always wandering through the desert in search of an oasis to spend the night, was beginning to fade as well. As Lot began his move into the valleys, he was warned by Abram and many others that the city of Sodom was a place where no one wanted to go. The people there were terrible in so many ways. And as much as Lot felt he was better than Abram, he agreed with him on this one. Moving to this city with a terrible reputation didn't seem worth the risk. But as Lot met passing travelers from Sodom, he realized that they weren't that bad. They were definitely better with him around to be a good influence on their behavior. So Lot had started making visits to Sodom and staying at his friends' homes. Together, they made fun of the really messed up people who were obviously the problem with Sodom. As time continued to pass, a lot of the things that used to bother Lot didn't seem to be a big deal anymore, and he really would like a permanent place to rest his head. So Lot purchased a nice house in one of Sodom's upper-class neighborhoods, vowing never to get involved with any of the real creeps that gave the place its bad name. Lot put away his tents for the last time and settled into the hustle and bustle of the city. Years passed again. There was one really wild incident where the king of Sodom got into a quarrel with a more powerful king, and in the ensuing battle, most of Sodom's soldiers ended up drowning in tar pits. So it goes. 
powerful kings stormed the city and took Lot and some others prisoner. Despite Lot's questionable, at best, treatment of Abram, the older man came through for his nephew and completely routed the enemy forces. But that had been long ago, and Abram had simply returned everything to the status quo. Lot went back to his house in Sodom, chalking the whole thing up to the inevitabilities of living in the ancient world rather than any real problem with the city. For that matter, what was the problem with Sodom? He'd heard dreadful things, but the place wasn't even half as bad as they'd said. Lot rose early one Monday morning and sipped his morning coffee. It was a really good day. He'd been in Sodom for nearly 20 years and had built a thriving business as a merchant. He opened his door with a smile, music playing in his head as he fancied himself the main character of his own story. This was the life. Little did he know that, in less than 24 hours, he would be running out of the city in panic, nothing to his name but the tunic on his back, saddled with a whole lot of trauma. But to explain just how Lot got into that position in such a short amount of time, we'll have to travel 50 miles into the mountains to Abram's tents, where he's just putting away breakfast. Three mysterious men are standing under a nearby oak tree, and Abram walks over to them to see what they're up to. The three men stood in a knot at the edge of Abram's camp, discussing something seemingly very important. As they stood, lost in their conversation, Abram strode up purposefully, but warmly. He wanted them to know that they were welcome to stop and stay as long as they wanted, if perhaps they needed some rest from the journey. Abram politely addressed the tallest man, who appeared to be the leader. Did the group want to have lunch with him? Over bites of roasted calf and rita, the tall man with white hair got to talking, but the stuff he was saying didn't make any sense. Randomly, he announced that Abram, an old man with an equally elderly wife, would have a child within the next year. When Abram's wife, Sarah, laughed quietly to herself inside the tent, the tall man somehow heard her and called her out for doubting God. Wait. Abram looked at this guy with renewed curiosity. What was he on about? Doubting the old man's word was the same as doubting God? The old man stood up. Allow me to introduce myself, he said, and something in his appearance was otherworldly in a way that Abram had never seen before. Whether it was some magic or trick of the light, he seemed to tower above them, and his voice boomed in a way that had to be supernatural. He was Yahweh, and he was just stopping by on his way to Sodom. Yahweh and Abram strolled to the edge of a cliff, where they could see Sodom a great distance away, tiny wagons crawling on the ground like little ants, and both of them sat in silence for a minute. It was Abram who finally spoke. He was just checking to make sure because it didn't seem possible. This was the Yahweh who created everything? Who had absolute power? Who Abram had worshipped that very morning? Abram knew that's what the tall man had said, but it all just seemed so surreal. Yahweh nodded. He was the God who Abram had been worshipping. Abram questioned again. Why did Yahweh even bother to come see him? He was just a human, and Yahweh was God himself. Why? He and Abram were friends, and it wouldn't be fair to go forward with his plans without briefing Abram on the whole issue. See, a lot of people have been praying recently, begging God for mercy from the cruel tyrants in Sodom. From the stuff he'd heard, it was really bad down there. Yahweh was headed down there to see if it was as awful as all that. If it was, he would cast his judgment on the place. If not, he'd know that people had been exaggerating. Abram looked incredulously. Yahweh was God. He could see everything from heaven. What was the point of making the trip all the way to Sodom to check the place out? Surely he already knew what was going on. And how would it be to look like the God who thundered down from heaven on random places without due process? 
Yahweh wasn't that type of God. Instead, he was an ally of humanity. It was his duty to both take the reports of injustice seriously, but to have mercy on those who still had some desire to do good. Speaking of those who still wanted to do good, Abram asked God what he would do if he found 50 good people in the city. His nephew Lot lived in Sodom, and surely Lot had some good reason for doing that. They couldn't be all bad over there. Surely Yahweh wouldn't write off his nephew's family as collateral damage in the process of trying to take out some bad people. That wouldn't be fair. Yahweh shook his head. If there were 50 good people, he'd spare the city. But there was a feeling in the pit of Abram's stomach. Suppose there weren't fifty. He'd heard the rumors too, and he'd heard that the place was very bad. He addressed Yahweh again. Seriously, he knew that this was rude, and that Yahweh was literally God of everything who had plans beyond his understanding. But he'd already made a big ask, and he was going to bite the bullet and follow his request up with another one. What if, maybe, there weren't 50 good people, but five less than 50. Yahweh smiled. 45? He would spare the city if there were 45 good people. Abram kept on bargaining with God, each time apologizing profusely for his boldness but lowering the number just a bit. The final agreed-upon number was 10. Yahweh would spare the city if he could find 10 good people there. As the conversation came to a close, Abram and Yahweh shook hands. Yahweh picked up the staff that he left leaning against a rock. It was time for him to head over to Sodom. We return to Lot, who was wrapping up his work at the merchant's table and getting ready to go home when he saw two strangers in the corner of the town square, clearly talking among themselves about their plans. If Lot had been with Abram earlier that day, he would have recognized them as the two men who had been traveling with Yahweh. But he hadn't, so he assumed they were just normal travelers. The men's words seemed to confirm that. They were on a long journey and were just going to spread some bedding out here in the square and get an early start. They were what? Lot's words were an incredulous whisper. He shook his head emphatically. He didn't know where they were from, and maybe that was safe somewhere else, but they could not do that here. Even now, someone might have seen them. They'd better go to his house. Quickly. His house? The men weren't mirroring Lot's whisper, nor were they comfortable intruding on someone's hospitality. They could manage out here in the square. Lot was being overdramatic. The cobblestones weren't that rough after wrapping themselves in blankets. It was no biggie. They'd been doing this for the past few weeks. And they would not be doing it tonight. Lot was adamant. They would go to his house. It wouldn't be any trouble at all, and he loved making food for his guests. The two men rolled their eyes. Fine, they'd come. But he should know that they didn't want to be a lot of trouble for him. Wait, could they stop making puns about his name? He just met them. In fact, would they stay quiet because they had already drawn too much attention to themselves and the city was not safe? The two men sat in the house while the food was cooking and one of them resurrected the question about the city's safety. What did Lot mean by not safe, he was about to ask, before they began to hear whoops, shouts, and jeers. Bring out your visitors so that we can sexually assault them, the ringleader bellowed. The two men looked at each other, then at Lot. Wait, what? Lot put his finger to his lips. This was normal. He could negotiate with these guys. They were his friends. His what? Lot stood at the door and leaned his head out. He wasn't going to hand over the men but he could throw his teenage daughters out and let the men do whatever they wanted with them. Deal? The two men looked at Lot incredulously. 
That was beyond messed up. What kind of hellhole was this city? Lot shrugged. This was more or less just casual everyday stuff. The men of the city were very disturbed by what Lot said, but not in the grossed out with both themselves and Lot brand of disturbed that I am right now. They howled in anger. Lot was an out-of-towner, and he thought that he could tell them how to live their lives? Sexually assaulting newcomers was a classic hazing ritual that they did here in Sodom. Who was Lot to interfere with their cultural practices? The ringleader came to Lot's door and began to hammer on it with his staff. They'd treat Lot a lot worse than they had planned for the two guests. Things were looking pretty dire inside until one of the two men waved his arm and the thuds on the door turned to cries of dismay and confusion. There was cursing and shouting outside and angry words and the sounds of blows. Cautious but curious, after a few minutes, Lot ventured to open the door and he saw the once formidable mob bumbling into each other. They were blind. He looked with incredulity toward the two men. What was this magic? He cried in terror. The men shifted into their true angelic form, and Lot shrank back, stunned. They were angels. The angels put their hands on Lot's shoulder. This might be rough to hear, but Yahweh was even now preparing to incinerate Sodom because of its wickedness. They had to get out now, or they would die in the morning. It was time to go. Time to go? This was his home, Lot whined. His home? Where they sexually assaulted random people and had, five minutes ago, threatened to sexually assault Lot? The angels hadn't wiped the minds of that mob outside, they just put up a temporary obstacle to protect Lot from their rage. If Yahweh didn't destroy the city, Lot would be in for it once the blindness wore off. This roused Lot enough to leave his house and run, bumping against the maddened, blind savages who were unaware that their prey was passing through their very midst. He stumbled down back alleys until he reached the home of one of his married daughters. As he tore open the door, madly gasping for breath, he saw that he was lucky. He'd caught them while his second married daughter and her husband were visiting. He choked out the words. Two angels just struck half the town blind and told me I needed to leave now. They're going to destroy the city. The sons-in-law were choking too, but with laughter. Dude, what a good sport. Their father-in-law was hilarious. The sons-in-law definitely had had a couple beers, and this was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. What a great practical joke. They should try this one again. City being destroyed and all that? Hilarious. Lot screamed that it was not a practical joke. They were all going to die. Come on. The sons only chuckled. That was a good one. Lot should probably know when to stop, though. This was getting to be too much. Lot tried again to convince his sons-in-law, his daughters, anyone, but they just laughed. They held out a beer to him and slapped him on the back. The joke was over. He could just kick it with them if he wanted. Or better yet, maybe he could go sleep off the joking mood in the back bedroom. Though Lot continued to plead, a lot, they didn't listen. Eventually, in anger and frustration, Lot tore open the door, left the house, and slumped against the outside wall. He opened his eyes to the gray early morning twilight. Last night must have all been a dream. He slouched home through the empty streets, eyes still squinting and body sore from sleeping against a stone wall. No mob waited in the shadows, and in the clarity of the morning he was sure no young men were sitting at home. What kind of mushrooms had his wife picked for dinner? As he opened the door, his wife and two daughters were looking at him really angrily. He shrugged. He didn't really know why that was. He'd just go to sleep for a bit and figure everything out when he woke up. At this moment, the door exploded open and Lot screamed in terror and shock. There, the two young men stood, yelling at Lot that he needed to go. Now. There wasn't time. Lot stood, incredulously, with a blank look on his face. He dreamed about these two guys last night, it hadn't been a good one, and he was going to take a nap before he dealt with any of this. The two angels looked at each other in disbelief. There was only one thing left to do. 
Each angel grabbed two of the family members, one by each arm, and literally dragged them out of the city. As they reached the city gate, they finally let go of Lot and his family. Lot's wife immediately started running back toward the city. One of the angels reached out and deftly caught her. The other pointed toward the mountains. They needed to run for their lives. They could not look back or stop on pain of death. As soon as they reached shelter, God was going to destroy Sodom because of its wickedness. This punishment was more than he could bear, Lot wheedled. Couldn't he please just go to that city over there? They couldn't be that evil over there. The angels nodded, now clearly in a hurry. I mean, they absolutely were that evil. That was a terrible place too and was about to be destroyed, but Yahweh would hold off on that one if Lot would just run. Feeling like he'd gotten a good deal out of the angels, Lot and his family finally started running, tearing across the field, stumbling over potholes, and desperately trying to reach Zoar, the city that Lot had pointed out. The family was strewn across the Jordan floodplain, with Lot's wife at the front, their daughters in the middle, and Lot at the back, panting heavily. About halfway, though, Lot's wife started doubting her decision. Sodom hadn't really been all that bad. Plenty of places had to be worse, right? This was madness. They'd had a home, and they were running away because two dudes had showed up at their house. Two pranksters spewing absurd ideas that her husband somehow believed. Lot's wife stopped running and slowly turned back toward Sodom. She was going home. As she turned, her body slowly began to turn white, starting with her fingertips, then her toes, then the tips of her hair. The white powder took over her body as she screamed, then suddenly stopped. Her body froze in place like a statue. She'd become a pillar of salt. Lot, screaming in horror because his wife had just been transfigured into a popular seasoning before his eyes, continued running. His daughter stumbled in terror, but didn't dare look back. The family kept on running until they, gasping for breath, fell down inside the city gate of Zoar. At that moment, there was a loud explosion, and the orangish purple of the morning sky became an ungodly blood red. Flames exploded from Sodom in its sister city, Gomorrah. For a few seconds, Lot had to cover his eyes to shield them from the light. Then, the fire disappeared, leaving the valley shrouded in darkness. The lights of Sodom no longer danced in the distance. There was only a grayish-black haze as smoke ascended from where Lot's home used to be. Meanwhile, Abram stood on the rock where he'd sat with Yahweh and looked down in silence. He hoped that Lot was still alive and doing well, wherever he was. Lot may have still been alive, but he wasn't doing well. Shocker, the angels were right about the fact that Zoar had been a bad place. That, coupled with the way Lot had mysteriously escaped Sodom just before the city had been destroyed, made the locals think that something was fishy. They harassed and threatened Lot, and out of fear, Lot soon ended up fleeing the city and living in a cave. In that dark, lonely cave, Lot's daughters schemed. Their society didn't value women much, but it did value male children. In order for them to have any sort of future, they needed to have those children. But how? Their family was a disgrace, and everyone feared the name of Lot. Drug our father and sexually assault him? One of them asked. The other shrugged. Nothing worse than he'd planned to do to them back in Sodom. So that's exactly what they did. The two of them got pregnant and each of them had sons, who became regular little psychopaths. The two boys ended up gathering a following and formed two nations. Nations that became a thorn in the side of anyone good. 
Over the years, the story trickled out of the cave in various forms, and people pieced together the story of how the once mighty Lot ended up dying, abandoned and alone, in some cave in the western mountains. His story became a cautionary tale, and people heard it, and feared. But the biggest takeaway from the story of Lot is not one of fear. It's quite the opposite. God didn't send a bolt of lightning down from above upon the head of some poor, unsuspecting person who'd made a mistake. Lot, who'd become nearly as evil as the people around him, wasn't condemned to destruction. God still saw in him some tiny desire to do the right thing and literally bent heaven and earth to save a man who'd done things that were repulsive to God. God sent angels to physically drag Lot out of danger when he was unwilling to go on his own two feet. The infinite God literally changed his entire plans just to make sure that Lot was safe, sparing an entire city on his request, and holding off his plans until Lot got somewhere safe. There's nothing more that Yahweh could have done for Lot. All of the harm that Lot suffered was self-inflicted in spite of God's best efforts. Many people, both Christians and non-Christians alike, serve gods that are eager to punish that need people to take certain actions to please them. But that's not Yahweh. Through the story of Lot, God reveals his personability. Yahweh comes down from heaven to have a chat with one of his friends about whether Sodom should be destroyed. He listens to Abram's plea for mercy. He's heard about the way the city of Sodom has oppressed people and goes down to see for himself so that everyone can be sure that he's a fair God. God isn't the kind of person who rains judgment down from on high. He's among us. He listens to us. And he does everything possible to help us change. That's the kind of God we serve. One of the common beliefs is that Sodom was destroyed because its people were homosexual. That the chief problem was that men wanted to sleep with other men. In fact, this is such a prevalent belief that the legal term for homosexual relations, and certain types of heterosexual relations, is sodomy. I'm being purposefully vague here. If you want, you can look up the details. The point I'm trying to make is that this belief is biblically incorrect. Throughout the Bible, the name Sodom is synonymous with sin. Ezekiel 16 specifies exactly what sin Sodom represents. She was arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. She did not help the poor and needy. She was haughty and did detestable things before me. Jesus speaks similarly about Sodom. Jesus' only words about Sodom was that her people were eating and drinking, buying and selling, and planting and building until the day Sodom was destroyed. Sodom's sin wasn't a specific action that was so bad that God had to finish them off. Instead, the people of Sodom merely got so caught up in chasing their own pleasure and enjoyment that they refused to take notice of the oppression when it was in their midst. They refused to stand up against the evil among them because it was inconvenient and uncomfortable until they became blind to their own wickedness and did horrible things. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about how the people of Sodom would rise up at the final judgment and condemn the generation that rejected Jesus. Sodom had only become blind to the oppression of foreigners. But the Jewish leaders, reading crystal clear prophecies that pinpointed the coming of the Messiah to a specific season, were so caught up in their own status that they made the entire worship of Yahweh an act of oppression and, as a result, missed the Son of God himself. Too often we consider blindness to oppression as somewhat of a minor sin. We emphasize compliance with the ceremonies and basic rules of Christianity. But the Pharisees kept every single ceremony and every single rule. Yet, because they rejected justice and mercy, they missed the Messiah. The sad story of Lot and the destruction of Sodom is a lesson to warn us of the dangers of letting ourselves get caught up in our own lives and becoming so blind to the oppression around us that we miss God himself. The second takeaway from this story comes from a popular saying, The house always wins. Many of you know that that's a cautionary saying straight out of Vegas casinos. People go to casinos 
engage in risky behavior, and feel like they've hit a streak of luck. Their hubris tells them that they've managed to put one over on the casino, that though the odds are stacked against them, they're better than the crowd and have beaten the odds. The house will always win is a warning for these gamblers that the success is only temporary, and if they push their luck, they will eventually lose everything. It's similar with sin. Sin can be enjoyable for a while. Doing the wrong thing can be thrilling. Sometimes it feels like you're immune to the consequences, or that the consequences you were warned of don't exist. People play with alcohol and drugs, thinking that it won't affect them like it does everyone else. People expose themselves to godless entertainment and ideologies, confident that it won't rub off on them. Maybe it will affect someone who is less discerning, but they'll be okay. For those people, for all of us, because we all do it, the house will always win. If we push our luck with sin, like Lot, we will eventually lose everything. That's all for this week. Two weeks from now, we'll be doing another story from the perspective of the Greek underworld, and we'll learn about someone who takes foolish risks and again loses everything, dying in ultimate irony. Why so depressing, Caleb? because I think a point needs to be made. We as Christians often give God credit for forgiving the little things, small mess-ups, but we often assume that God won't forgive the big mistakes. We forget just how willing God is to forgive and just what lengths he will go to to help even people who repeatedly refuse his help. Until we can understand how much God forgives people, how can we forgive ourselves and others? How can we love him? It's only when we understand God's willingness to forgive that we can truly stop focusing on ourselves, stop judging others, and start focusing on Him. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave a five-star review and tell your friends about this podcast. I'd really appreciate your help sharing and growing this show. Credits to Caleb Howard for script writing and narration. Theme music is by Roa and Zakar Valaha. Other music credits are listed in the episode's description. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>